accidental, you know, but a lot of things with them learn came up by accident, you know. For example, um, because they probably leave the seeds that we used to eat out of door and realize them start to grow accidentally. And yes, him start to figure out how to grow the seeds them. And him neighbor now, him now become so good at growing seeds, him neighbor them willing to trade a cow for some seeds because this man know once upon a time we never used to plant, we used to hunt them and eat them. But because we find so much, we put on some outside in the dirt and it start growing, we say, wait, this is good. And so because him learn how to do this over and over, him, him become specialized in, a, in a growing grains, growing seed, growing corn. And so it may not know as a result of specialization and what specialization does. Let's say, for example, two of us are doing something. Um, we are shooting basketball hoops. I don't know nothing about shooting and you know about shooting. And we need to shoot um, a certain amount of ball in the hoop. Who do you think I got to shoot more ball than who? Me. You will have more knowledge of shooting in the hoops. So yes, you, will, you will produce more balls in that hoop, and that's production. So a person who specializes, he's able to produce more of one thing. And because he specializes and he's able to produce more than one thing, before you know it, he have too much. And so he needs to get rid of some. So he must find somebody who wants some. And when him do that, if he, he, with the grain, he's now able to go to Mr. John and say, I can get some milk, I give you some grain. I feel good. I can go to someone and say, give me a, me feel for chicken. Give me give some grain and you give me some chicken. And he go to, So because of that, now he's able to have the various things he wants because he was able to specialize and prepare and produce more. So that's the advantage of specialization, ability to produce more. Production increases because you're able to specialize because you're now good at something. Now we're going to see in the future in this unit in a, um, this topic where in business where specialization is used in a production just to get more goods produced in terms of specialization. And we'll see where even the country does something where they specialize. So we'll see where from the olden days, as a result of specialization, people start now to develop an economy. All right? Yes, so sir. we're moving along. Okay, so we're going to look at the disadvantages of the barter system now. One of the disadvantages of the system is the double quotient of want, right? So no trade can take place unless there is a double precedent of our want, that is your trading partner has what you want and wants what you have. This may require time and energy to find the suitable trading partner, right? So you want, I have, as you're seeing in the diagram, A wants the product E and B wants the product Y. A only have product A. So there, no trading could take place there because they don't have what each other wants, right? Right. You, you, you so, get that though. You get that coincidence of want. Um, yes, sir. You know about it from before, don't you? Uh, repeat. You knew about this from before? No, I, well, this is the first but I, I, From what I'm saying, I understand. Alright, tell me back. Let me see if you understand what I want you to understand. Well, basically, what this is showing, um, person with A as a certain good and person B as a certain good, but the person B doesn't have exactly what A wants and A doesn't have everything that B wants. Alright. Are so, you foodie? You love food, right? Mango? <laughs> yes, please. Alright. So with the mangoes no. I love blackie. What mango do you love? Julie. No. Julie. East Indian. <laughs> Alright, you love East Indian and I love blackie. 
and we want to try the barter system. So we, we want to trade. I want blocky, right? And you only have your trolley. East Indian, sorry. So no trade can take place there because you don't have what I want and I don't have what you want. So therefore, me, I go look somebody else what we have um, my blocky and you are going to look who, somebody who have your jewelry. East Indian. Yes, All right. So, um, right. Me, me think you get it, but to my time, in terms of explaining it, the whole double coincidence, this is something that we need to oh, for zoom in a little bit. So what just happened is that there must be a double coincidence. Double coincidence mean you want the same thing when me want. That's what we call a double coincidence. It's a coincidence that me and you want the same thing. That At must happen. So if there is yes. no coincidence, if there is no double coincidence of once, meaning that you don't have what I want and I don't have what you want, or I might have what you want, but you don't have what I want. So watch me now. It must be double. You must have what I want and me if I have what you want. You can have what me want, but me not have what you want. So unless uh, both of we have what we want, then there is no double, double coincidence. So the double coincidence happen when the both of we have what the both of we want. That's a double coincidence. You get it? Yes, sir. So no trade can take place unless there is a double coincidence of one. That is it. Next one. An exchange rate. So before we read that, because mm -hmm. me know I would just read them something I know. More you tell me where you dig from that. Well, sir, the value of the product. Mm -hmm. Right. Explain yeah. one. Tell me it in a patwa. I for example. May I use the apple in, in this? Yeah, but the apple. Right. All right. Some of the some of the apple of um, well. All right. So for example, so some of them ripe and some on, of them green. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some ripe and some green, but me want straight ripe. And the trading partner of the fall. Chicken, right? But I'm of the chicken, but not really the chicken. But me of the apple, some green, some ripe. But my trading partner want the apple, all the apple ripe. So it doesn't match up to. The rate right. of the, the chicken. All right, me get where I say, but the rate in this case is deciding. Me get where I say, I'm going to understand that because that's going to be a problem. If if you have a good solid fall and um, me have a basket of apple where well, some of them are ready to ripe it, then we can have a, a, a problem. But how the exchange rate come in is me must decide how much fall for one apple or how much box of apple for one fall. How we decide that? How we decide the value of my fall? So me and you come and you work hard and come with your creator back up. And you say, you are one or two fall for your box of apple. Me and you say, no, I'm going one fall for your box of apple. So we didn't know where if you are arguing know, or me might say, you are going, me want 10 apple and a half a fall for 10 apple. And you have to say, half a fall for 10 apple, so 20 apple that. You understand? So we have to decide the value a one good versus the next good. How we decide the value? How do we decide an exchange rate? The rate at which we should trade each thing. How we know say it's not a cow for a box of apple? Or how we don't know say a two cow and a truck for a box of apple? We don't know the value of the apple. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. So yes, we sir. must come to an agreement to say, well, you know where we'll do it now. Ten green apple and five ripe apple equal one rooster. So anytime you want to measure something, you know, you, 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 you know, say, well, a 10 green apple, 10 ripe apple, or 5 green apple equal one rooster. That's our exchange rate. You understand? 
But there was a problem with that, and that was one of the another problem. Them couldn't decide how much fall for one box of apple for, for, for make this trade be fair. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, so it's having found others who wanted what they had to offer. Early traders still had to agree on the qualities of each other goods that were to be exchanged. Imagine the difficulty in deciding how many chickens to exchange for a box of apple, as mentioned previously, right? So one of the other disadvantages of barter would be diversity of goods. You want to give that another go to see what what you get from that one? Mr. Anderson? Repeat, miss. What comes to mind when you think of barter? The barter system, diversity of goods. Um... Well, what to what say? I was just saying, probably the person cannot make it the exact amount that the other good, the exchange rate. The per probably one of the pers one of the person cannot make it up to the amount that the other good values. Okay, diversity. Some rates of exchange. Well, yes, go ahead. You know, you may, you know, I just say, man, say. <laughs> so, uh, this is about dividing the goods. It's divisibility of goods. So, you you are now going to say, I, I, I want to divide the goods. The problem, one of the other problems is deciding how to divide a good. So, one bowl of tomato, um, which space teeth of, is value half a sheep. All right? Yes, one, one bowl equal half a sheep. But the man can't kill, he can't cut the sheep in a half and uh, exchange it for a bowl and still keep the sheep alive. And he can't store the sheep. So he may really lose, though. So it's not yes, easy to split. Some goods can't split in apart. You see, while we are looking at these problems, we are seeing at the same time that's how money, um, the pro money solves these, these problems. More, you see them. We are go we are going on money after this, but but in order for us, for example, if the man did come with a cow, I want a drink of rum. In, in, in one drink of rum, I just one cow foot. You know, if you check it out, you know. So suppose him decide same one, if my bartender decide same one, pay for him wrong. Um, the man you that, know that a cow leg is very big when you come up to the thigh part, right? Holy for me that. So a foot still wouldn't equate to a drink of rum. Well, it's that's debatable because you can't tell me the value of my rum compared to your um, cow foot. So we also still have a problem with exchange rate there. So this so, is the problem we're talking about. Kishan. Exactly. All right, so if you're seeing that, that's the problem. That's, a, that's the other thing where divisibility of good has to do with. You, you see, why I say this is that you need to learn how to explain all of them. What does divisibility of goods cover? It means that I may have a good, I may have a good that I want to exchange, but it's unable to cut it in a half. As you see, for the example, one worth of apple, one bowl of apple um, worth half a live sheep, then it was not possible to trade only one bowl of apples because you cannot have half a sheep and still keep it alive. Right? So basically, that's what the visibility of goods cover. Okay. So the other one for is storage of wealth. Right? So it's saying here, many goods which have been exchanged could not be stored for use at a future date because such things as food would not be stored for a long period of time. Expiry. It's going to expire. Expiration. Yeah. Yes. So it's impossible because you may trade you know my shirt. You can get one 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 couple wear out of it. And you give me 
one like what piece of chicken chicken that are just one cook one eat and it finished well you have the shirt so it can't be stored as well right yes miss understand yes miss so let's go over the four advan disadvantages again so the first one was the double coincidence of want where we both needed to have want the same thing right yes miss. we both we have to be wanting the same thing at the same time the other one is the exchange rate exchange rate. Yes, miss. yes so it's double coincidence of want where we needed to be we, we need to want the same thing at the same time the exchange rate where it has to have the same amount of value it it has to equate to the same thing diversity yes, of goods where it cannot be split it would be unfair for me to ask you to give up half of your goods for mine especially if it's a livestock and it cannot be split the last one is storage of wealth all right yes, yes. so let's move on so let this concludes the barter system which has both advantages and disadvantages. However, with all the difficulties affecting the barter system, a stable system of exchange had to be developed that could be, excuse me, with the problems of barter, with the plague, with the problems of barter, such a commodity that would be used as an exchange, medium of exchange had to be durable, portable, diversible and of course be generally accepted by everyone but even in the current scenario if you want to enjoy the benefits of the barter system then you must visit barter for gain so all right you go ahead sorry if you interject like that um but no all right so we have we have covered the barter system and it's important that we looked at the barter system because it's a springboard for how our modern money came into being and it is because of the problems that we had with barter that caused some genius to decide that we need to move away from just barter we need to have something that solve all these problems so you will see that it has to be durable because we want to be able to store it for some time. It has to be portable. You can imagine trying to carry a cow across the desert just to trade for a bottle of wine. So it must be portable. It must be divisible, meaning that instead of a half a sheep, now we have several things can come, can divide um, for our apples. It must also, in terms of durable, so let's so look at us finding a, a solution for all the problems now. If we decide so we we'll get a buckle of a box or a basket, a basket of apple I use that as money. But apples is not durable, so that's a problem. While it's portable and it's divisible, you can have five apples and six apples for, for, for buy something. But the problem with, with apples is that it's not durable, so we can't use it as money. So you see how the money come into being now. We have to have all of these things must be working all at once. It must be divisible, it must be durable, it must be pureable, pure um portable. And it must be a medium of exchange. It must be something that persons are willing to take. All right? And so that's how, how these problems now, to solve these problems, we know, ended up with the whole idea of money. Like, how comes a piece of paper is more valuable than a cow? Like, I have a piece of paper in my hand and I have a cow. Yet still a man will run down the paper and left the cow. Why? You ever wonder, you ever look for money and just say, how, how paper end up with value more than cow? I don't understand. Why? Tell me why. You don't tell me why. Well, because uh, well, it's durable, portable, and... Yeah. and it's it's acceptable. Yes, yeah. 
and 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 also it it it's a storage of wealth. So because we put a value to it, because remember one of the problems with the man did have is that he couldn't decide what the exchange rate. So if everybody come together and say this money have a certain value and it value more than a cow, then the man will look on it and say, based off of the agreement between everybody in the world, the money is more valuable than the cow, so I go for the money. All right? Yes, sir. All right. So are there any questions for this unit? Because you have just okay. concluded the first, the first part of this unit where it's about assistance. Is there anything that you were not clear on? Well, I would like to go over the advantages again. All right, That's you right. will. You will. Don't worry about it. Because remember, it's going to be on the platform that you can read over and go through it. And you're going to have this recording that you can play. All right? Yes, sir. Wait, you're going to see it again before the session ends. Okay. Okay, so let's just move on. So, why do you think money was invented your question nothing will be the boss well for a safer way to to transport well money was used as almost anything but then feathers seashells and yeah mm -hmm, but but them money, why, no. them, why were they invented and uh, hold on. So what I want to get in here is all of those things. Feather was money. Yes, Shell it was. It was, was used money. as a form as money. As they had word. But yeah, then but you can go back to subsistence economy, where and start to think about the barter system and trading. Remember well, what let me the tell you, let me tell you. Let me tell you why exactly. Is it something that we just discussed? Because we had problems with the barter system. To solve these problems, then we had to come up with something that could solve all the problems that we had with the barter system. So if we decide we're going to use precious feathers, then it's because it has a potential to solve the problems of the barter system. Tell me one problem of the barter system. One problem of the barter system? Yeah. The people didn't did not well they would have problem trading because they disagree with the other their their trading partners policy. Remember, me tell you four, remember me tell you there are four disadvantages and we just call them, you know, one of them will say, remember the heading that they fall on now. So one, double coincidence of want. Two, exchange rate. So these are, these are they. You have to have them, in a, you have to have them like that. It's not the explanation more, more you tell me those. So you're going to say one problem is double coincidence of one. That's another problem is exchange rate. Right? Yes, and then there are two more. So more you tell me those. What tell me one one problem with the barter system that you remember? Let me just tell you two. There are two more. The visibility of goods. The visibility. So yes, how would Feather solve the problem of the visibility? Feather can be split up. Can split yeah, up. Can you can have a portion of feather, right? Yes. Sir. So if everybody says, all right, one feather worth one cow, right? Then a person yes, will sir. say, if he might come buy two cow, he might come with two feather. Yeah. So a man will want a cow and him have sheep, all he might do is say, the sheep and the sheep are the two sheep get one feather take the one feather and buy the cow so that kind of solve a problem because it also solve the problem of double coincidence of one because you know really want feather you know, just like how you don't really want money you know you want money yes eh? yes sir i bet you think so you want money you want me to prove to you so you don't want money yes sir i can prove that you want me to prove that to you so you don't want money 
Yes, sir. All right, tell me something that you do with money when you get it. Well, you have a fine, sir. When I get money, is I want it to do with goods or services. Exactly. So, actually, so, it goes more. so only thing you do with money is actually hold it until you get what you want. So if you get money, you yes, want a sir. laptop. So it's not the money you want, it's the laptop. But money acts as a medium. The way to get the laptop. Yeah, and mm-hmm. money just acts as a medium for hold the value. <laughs> you see, nobody don't want money. Man. <laughs> nobody wants money. You just want what money can buy. All right? All right, carry on. Okay. So we're going to watch a video now on... I'm not hearing it here. You were saying something? Yes, I was saying I'm not hearing your video. Okay. Are you hearing her video? Um... No, I'm not hearing anything. I think because she didn't share okay. her computer Give sound. Give me a second. Okay, so let's take this from the top. The history of money in 10 minutes. Number one, early money. Long yes, before, we're hearing. People were quite happy making, doing, and growing things for one another. In small communities, they could largely remember the payments and receipts of what was exchanged. Keeping tabs or tallies of these exchanges helped with a key requirement, which was to record who'd been paid and who was still owed. But as communities grew, so the exchanges became more and more numerous. And as people created things for the common good and rulers began to impose taxes, so the accounting was increasingly hard to keep track of. IOU notes might have been a neat solution, but unless you knew the individual issuer personally, they were hard to enforce or verify. So instead, people started to use objects, such as whale's teeth, as a kind of IOU. This intermediate step in the exchange process meant that people were free to trade with anyone, and they could even store up purchasing power for later use with their retradable IOU tokens. So at the same time that humans invented money, they'd also invented debt. Number two, metal money. Once people start using money to facilitate trade, whether in the form of shells, barley, feathers, or whale's teeth, some useful characteristics of money become apparent. Barley, for example, is heavy to carry, so not portable or even durable. Whale's teeth are hard to split into two, so not easily divisible. Shells can be picked up on any beach, so not exactly scarce. And if the token standing as money doesn't have much intrinsic value, like feathers, it's hard to trade outside your immediate community. Another noticeable feature of money was that having a lot of it made you powerful, and power could get you a lot of it. So kings hit on the idea of minting coins from precious metals, stamping them with an emblem that guaranteed their weight and value. Metal money ticked all the money boxes, and because it had intrinsic value, it could be used to trade with other communities. But the success of metal money brought temptation, and sovereigns soon realized that by slimming down the coins or slipping cheaper base metals into the mix, they could make money by circulating debased currency worth less than face value. Number three, paper money. Carrying around large quantities of coins could be exhausting work, and it was early Chinese rulers that hit on the idea of keeping their heavy coins back in the palace while issuing IOU certificates on paper for long-distance trading. Although the paper had no intrinsic value, people trusted that it was worth what it said it was worth, and they could always exchange it for gold or silver or the coins it represented. As global trade grew, the idea of paper money caught on. But traders and lenders were concerned that it was a bit too easy just to print money. So they tried to link the value of money to the value of gold, which had the benefit of creating a standard for exchange between different currencies. Attempts to peg currencies to a fixed gold standard continued for centuries. 
but the need for flexible exchange rates always prevailed, and since the early 1970s, the world has stopped trying to keep to a gold standard. So today, the only thing that distinguishes the value of a banknote from any other paper is trust. Number four, controlling money. Years ago, on the Pacific island of Yap, the nearest thing to gold was the ray stone, notable for its enormous size and weight. From the day the chiefs decided to ask for their taxes in ray stones, it meant that for all taxpayers, the currency became universal, unavoidable, and under the control of the chief. The most valuable ray stones were just so heavy that the Yap population tended to leave their currency in one place and then trade effectively in promises. Any trader who owned a ray stone on Yap could issue a promissory note against the value of their stone. And thus, banking was born. And once the chiefs accept these promissory notes instead of ray stones for their taxes, they effectively lose control of the amount of money in circulation, the money supply. In the 20th century, some economists argued that the amount of money in circulation directly affects economic performance, and it is important for governments to try to control it. But this is not easy especially when it's private lenders that create most of it. Number five, money and inflation. In the 16th century, Spain brought home massive additional supplies of precious metals from the colonies. But what seemed like a dream come true, and should surely have boosted trade, turned sour when traders simply put up the price of their goods to match this new purchasing power. So the returning explorers were no better off, and those without the new gold were even worse off. It was only those who had debts, which had in effect got smaller, who were actually better off. This was the first appearance of the theory that too much money chasing too few goods can cause inflation. Unless that is, that traders produce more goods. Or unless the newer, bigger money supply circulates less rapidly by people saving more, either because they are rich enough or because they're particularly gloomy about the future. Number six, international money. In the 18th century, the British forced their colonies in America to pay their taxes in pounds, and they made it illegal for the British colonies to print their own money. This meant that the colonies were forced to trade with the motherland to access the currency. According to Benjamin Franklin, the American War of Independence was caused by the sheer burden of British taxation and the disadvantageous trade needed to access British pounds. And the hard-won freedom after the war allowed the Americans to create the American dollar. Which, because of the country's vast trade and trustworthy tax base, eventually became the most widely used currency on the planet, leading many countries, including Britain, to store large reserves of dollars. But by choosing to keep a reserve currency in dollars, the UK ceded at least some power back to those runaway Americans. Number seven, money and building banks. By the 19th century, banking had become a thoroughly respectable business. Making a profit by basic money lending, banks paid a lower rate of interest for the money they took in than they charged on the money they loaned out. But the banks soon realized that as long as depositors didn't all ask for their money at once, they could in fact lend out many times more money than they had on deposit. This is known as fractional reserve banking. On rare occasions when depositors all tried to get their money out at once, there was a run on the bank. And the effect on the wider economy was so serious that government started to insure customers' deposits to prevent it happening, and thereby enabling banks to loan out more and more. By the 21st century, some banks had taken fractional reserve banking to a whole new level, funding most of their loans not from cash deposits from savers, but with loans from other banks, often secured against bundles of previous loans. So when there was a run on the bank in 2007, banks like Northern Rock not only didn't have enough money to pay out, but the effect went way beyond just one bank. Number eight, money and saving the banks. To understand how governments tried to prevent global financial meltdown after 2008, economists distinguish between two kinds of money. Money created by banks inside the banking system and money created by governments outside the banking system. When a ba 
bank creates money by making a new loan, the bank of The history of money in 10 minutes. No, Number one, so early cool. money. Long before money was invented, people were quite happy and made particularly gloomy about the future. Banks often secured against bundles of previous loans. So when there was a run on the bank in 2007, banks like Northern Rock not only didn't have enough money to pay out, but the effect went way beyond just one bank. Number eight, money and saving the banks. To understand how governments tried to prevent global financial meltdown after 2008, economists distinguish between two kinds of money. Money created by banks inside the banking system and money created by governments outside the banking system. When a bank creates money by making a new loan, the bank acquires a new private asset, the loan, with an equivalent private liability to the borrower to pay it. This is money created inside the banking system. Governments can create money by selling new bonds. These bonds go into circulation as new private assets, but there is no equivalent private liability to pay them. Instead, this outside money is added to the public debt. Although it's normally a very small percentage of total money in the economy, it was this outside money that was used to buy up the bank's bad private debts and write them off. The private sector retained its wealth with new assets inside the system supported by government with public debt from outside the system. Number nine, the power of money. Since the last traces of a gold standard disappeared in 1973, the world has carried on trading in US dollars even though these aren't backed by anything of intrinsic worth. The US government's decision to borrow billions for its bank rescue and stimulus plan dramatically increased the supply of dollars, and some predicted that this would lead to a big fall in the dollar's value, on the basis that economies which print money so they can consume more than they produce will suffer price inflation and exchange rate depreciation. But six years on, this still hasn't happened. Why then does the dollar retain its value? Perhaps with so much of the world holding its wealth in US dollar assets, people simply have faith that the dollar will retain its value. And the knowledge that so many others share that faith reinforces the general optimism that the dollar will stay strong. Number 10, future money. Minted coins and paper money, once the cutting edge of technology, are now used in only 2% of transactions. Credit card and electronic banking technology has enabled massive global transactions to take place in a fraction of a second. And digital technology is enabling new currencies to be created. Linden dollars, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, which exhibit the enduring characteristics of money, being hard to forge, durable, portable, divisible and limited in supply, and which may even challenge the power of government-backed money. But until a government accepts taxes in bitcoins or other privately issued currencies, or banks start lending in them, they are not much different from any other token, such as whale's teeth. One sign that a new form of money has become important will be when governments and banks try to control it. And if governments and banks continue to have the power to control money, those who use it will always wonder to what purpose will they put that power. So that's it. You guys can unmute your mics now. So that's it for the history of money. What was your understanding from from the video you just watched? Um, money has been Welcome to Sun. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Go ahead, Kejan. Miss, um, money has evolved. Evolved. Yes. Anything else? Uh, um. So, son, you joined in late. You want to share your pointers on what you think the video was about, or what's your um, understanding? I didn't really get much, Miss. I 
like the gold standards um i understand that the government government took us off the gold standards and gave us money that mm-hmm. that worth nothing that wasn't worth nothing until the ages of exchange and that okay i wanted to bring across uh two important points as uh I'm pretty sure you guys have heard budget reading, right? And you've heard about price inflation and such words, right? You guys can take your mics um, off mute. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so price inflation. What's your idea of the inflation based on the video that you just watched? Please repeat, Miss. Inflation. Based on the video you just watched, um, it mentioned inflation a few times. So it will be one of one of the. You'll be seeing that word again further down in the syllabus. So inflation would be like the increase in price, increase of price in goods and services, right? So the video basically yes, showed the evolve money evolving from the subsistent economy to bartering to modern day living, right? So now we're going yes, to go on the role of money. So first, let's see what money is. So money is any object that is generally accepted as payment for goods and services and repayment of debt in a given socioeconomic context or country. Right? Excuse. So as mentioned before, you can the feather and the goat and the bartering and everything that was being traded off, it was being traded as a means of money. So money comes in three forms. Commodity money, fate money, and uh, fiduciary money. So... I would like for you to tell me what your commodity money, the three forms of money. I think I'll be giving you that for some homework, right? So by next class, you should be able to tell me. No man, you can create a look activity. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so money comes in three farms. Commodity money, fiat money, and fiduciary money. So we're going to watch a little video on the three types of the farms types of money, right? Yes, miss. Tell me if you hear it. There is a lot of controversy surrounding this topic, but broadly speaking, there are three main types of money. One, commodity money, with people using various commodities as mediums of exchange for thousands of years. Anything from gold or silver to seashells or cattle. In other words, individuals agree to accept a certain commodity for their products or services instead of bartering. However, even this approach is suboptimal as it can be difficult to carry commodities around all the time. Therefore, another type of money emerged. 2. Representative money, with people trading, let's say, pieces of paper which represent claims to commodities rather than trading the actual commodities. A good example was represented by the US dollar during the days of the gold standard. Because yes, people transacted using pieces of paper but were allowed to exchange them for physical precious metals whenever they wanted to. As of a certain point, only central banks were allowed to do this and eventually not even that was possible anymore, marking the end of the gold standard. That brings us to 
Three, fiat money, or money that isn't in any way backed by commodities, but has been declared legal tender by the state, so you need it to meet various obligations such as paying taxes. It has value because we believe it has value, or if you will, it's an equation involving supply and demand with the state's blessing sprinkled in. Some economists choose to never use the term fiat money and instead use fiat currency, because in their opinion, fiat currency doesn't meet certain conditions to be considered money, primarily because they do not consider it a proper store of value. Okay. Did you guys get anything from the video just now? Miss, yes, I'd like for you to restart video because it was going too fast. It was going too fast? Okay, sure. There is a lot of controversy surrounding this topic, but broadly speaking, there are three main types of money. One, commodity money, with people using various commodities as mediums of exchange for thousands of years. Anything from gold or silver to seashells or cattle. In other words, individuals agree to accept a certain commodity for their products or services instead of bartering. However, even this approach is suboptimal as it can be difficult to carry commodities around all the time. Therefore, another type of money emerged. Two, representative money, with people trading, let's say, pieces of paper which represent claims to commodities rather than trading the actual commodities. A good example was represented by the US dollar during the days of the gold standard. Because yes, people transacted using pieces of paper, but were allowed to exchange them for physical precious metals whenever they wanted to. As of a certain point, only central banks were allowed to do this, and eventually, not even that was possible anymore, marking the end of the gold standard. That brings us to... Three, fiat money, or money that isn't in any way backed by commodities, but has been declared legal tender by the state, so you need it to meet various obligations such as paying taxes. It has value because we believe it has value, or if you will, it's an equation involving supply and demand with the state's blessing sprinkled in. Some economists choose to never use the term fiat money and instead use fiat currency, because in their opinion, fiat currency doesn't meet certain conditions to be considered money, primarily because they do not consider it a proper store of value. Okay. Miss, so I understand that commodity. Commodity, yes. Commodity, money, is like early age money, like from seashells, silver to seashells. Okay, mm-hmm. And finish it. Fiduciary are represented. Uh, no. Yes, that's paper money. Like that's that would be the goal. Yes, yes. That's the example of the goal, and because the is not accepted. Commodity as... was. Go ahead. Commodity money was um art. Uh, Travel around it. It wasn't port that portable. Mm -hmm. So they use fiduciary money for a more portable way to get the money around. Mm -hmm. So they use paper to represent money. So what we're currently using is the fiat money or the fiat currency. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So more interject now because let's learn some things here. Um, so, all right, one, let's go all the way back to commodities money. Um, what, 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 what did you say commodities money was again? Like exchange, like an exchange of something valuable to another person. Exchange of something valuable to another person. Give me an example. As in Currency you are like Go ahead. As in, you have a biscuit and this person have another biscuit, but you don't like your biscuit and you like the biscuit that person have you trade it. Okay. Like All right. That. Yes. So commodities, money is the money that has the value in it itself. So whatever you trade, that's what has the value. 
unlike paper money that the value paper money in itself doesn't have any value right so commodities money in olden days would be like the shells and the, the coins and so on because they themselves have the value today we still have commodities money because we still trade gold so gold in itself is a commodity it's commodities money all right oil is a commodity even though we trade it for money but you people can use oil can trade oil for something else today so you must understand that commodity is the is the currency that has the value in itself once you give so you actually give you the direct okay um next everybody hearing me clear yeah. yes yes sir okay my data just gone low so make a kind of break up um next we looked at the fiduciary money or or what's the other term them use representative money Yes. Yes, sir. So that's where the gold standard. That's where the the gold standard came. Mister Brown. Mr. Brown? Okay, I think we just lost him. Yes, so let me see if I can pick up where he left off. Mr. Brown? Yes, um, I think my data just run me off a switch network just now. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Um, I was talking about representative money or, or fiduciary money. Now, what that is, is once upon a time, whenever they print any money, it must be backed by something. So if you have $1, then you must have $1 worth of gold put down somewhere. So when you give somebody, when you give somebody that $1, then you pass on that $1 worth of gold to somebody else. So it usually must be backed by something. And initially, and it was um, at that time the bank that had that um, opportunity of keeping that representative money. But again, in the early 1970s, about 1973, um, they decided that they're not going to... Oh, let me give you a little story about that. Um, they came together in about 1945 or, or thereabout and said, hey, why don't we all agree to pick all our money on one money? Mr. Brown, you're mute. Is anybody hearing me? We're hearing you now. Is everybody hearing me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Is anybody hearing me? Yes, sir. Wow. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Brown? It means nobody's. Your audio is in and out. Uh, me get kicked off. I think I'm going to go against her. Yeah, I was kicked off just now. Okay, okay so welcome back. So, um, as I was saying, um, in our own, so they usually say, all the world leaders come together and say, let us attach our money to one million money and then make that. Your audio is going in and out.
it's still not on as yet, so it, maybe it's your headset. I think you need to remove your headset. Me and money be back by the by by gold. Everybody good in the world was placed one place in and out, in and out still. You're good now. And no, really it's not good in it. I'll cut out again. When it cut out, yeah, when it cut out, I'm going to give you and make it just finish up, okay? Okay. Okay, Miss Morrison. Okay. But I was trying to give this story about. Oh, she just heard that. All right. Continue. Con Okay, so I guess you guys won't be hearing that story. We can postpone it till further date. Okay, so we're going to move on as to what money is. So, as it says here, it's the development of money solved many of the problems of barter which we've mentioned before. The money we use today was not available in this can you, form. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, from your start and didn't know you read. Can I make somebody else read, please? Like each student can take a chance and read. Sure. Yeah, thanks. It would be good to hear others take a Okay. Mr. Anderson? Yes, miss. Could you go ahead and read for me, please? Okay. Money. The development of... Miss, you guys yes. are hearing me? Yes, yes, we're hearing you. The development of money solved many of the problems of barter. The money we use today was not available in this farm to early man. Other things we are you was instead, these include... the. These include things that such as shells, dog's feet, beads, grains, spearheads, hides, arrowheads, fish hooks, and animals. Even today, many things are used instead of money in some parts of the world. When a country's economy collapses, people tend to change back to using goods instead of money because they do not trust any money anymore. Which is fair, right? Because if I invest my money, even yes, now in modern day society, where because of the whole coronavirus, um, the long lines at the banks are ridiculous. So persons, even myself, I'm considering to go back to storing money underneath my pillow. Right? Because do you think it's fair to be standing an hour or two just to get your money? Remember, it's your money, you know. So that's why they thought that, okay, well, we could go back. But we always come back to one system because of how society is, right? Susan, do you have anything to add? No, miss. You guys can keep your mics off on because sometimes we oh, tend to be talking and they slide. don't even realize the mics are off. So let's go to characteristics of money. So what are some of the char characteristics that you guys think are there for money? Vali. What did what do you mean by characteristics of money, please? Miss. Go ahead. Miss, can I explain? Like, wait, wait. No, I was asking, like, what do you mean when you say characteristics of money? Like, what are the perks of having, what, what do you think um, is money? Okay, what qualifies something to be money? Yes. What makes up money? What what are 
what are the, the, the necessary things that decides that something is money. Okay, I get it. So you can ask a question. So what are some of the things, guys, that you think are some of the things that money mo must be present to say something is money? Oh, see, there they are. Yes, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For us, you try. Me want you try. But I'm familiar with this part, miss. But it's there. Yeah, man, run it my ear. Tell me. Is that the car on that sportability? Yeah. Go on again. Hello? Yes, we're here. You catch one. Portability, that means it is at the car, carry around. Durability, um, it has no expiry, expiration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know, it goes spoil, like rotten tomatoes. <laughs> So, son, you wish to add the other? Suppose me tell you some of that. Mm. So, to look, Suppose uh, me tell you some more than gear. Wow. Uh, uh, that would look good. Let <laughs> <laughs> well, me tell you one. Let me ask you a question. And you tell me. Um, you play a game like Nintendo 64? You play a game? Kijan? Yes, sir. My mute? No, yeah. If you play a game, do you own a game? Yes, sir. Like, yes, sir. Um, you have a game, you have, you have game discs that you use? Or oh, yes, sir. That you use? Suppose me, yes, me just come one day and say, me just take up a tire and come and say, me I use my tire and buy one of your game CD then. You don't sell me? With the tire? One old tire for one. Wait, and game CD. After depend on the, depending on the tire, sir. All right. I'm going to dash with tire. Suppose me just carry a stone come say, hey, sell me a game uh, CD, you done? Sell no. Me. Why? Stone has no value, sir. Well, no idea. Okay, so tell me so. Sir? Mr. Brown, your idea is out. Something else about money then? Mm? Tell me something else have some form of value down. I'm helping you to bring out another character now, Amy. We just, you just came back. You hear me? Yeah. Oh, I was yeah, saying, sure. I was trying to help you to bring out the qualities of money. So, one of the things I said was, the fact that you just tell me that Money must be something that persons are willing to accept. So that's another one. And also you said that it didn't have any that's value. Right. So you only accept it if it has some form of value. And yes, that's right. So that's another one now. Miss Marcy can go. And I still don't hear it to send Brown. I would love to hear it. To send? Mr. Brown? Yeah, you're gonna move, you're gonna go on for the next slide. She can't read this. Okay. Uh, your audio went to a side just now. Okay, so. The characteristics for money is, as mentioned, it has to be doable. 
It has to be acceptable. Uh, I it has ask if Miss, I thought I was asking, I thought I was asking Miss um, Brown for this one. This I'm not one. hearing you. I'm not coming through clearly. Nobody not hear me. I was okay. asking, ask them to read. I'm going to send you a message. To son? Yes, miss. Okay. Could you read the next slide for me, please? Yes, miss. What are the characteristics of money? For something to be considered as money or in place of money, it must have the following qualities. Durability. It must be durable. It should not wear out easily. Acceptability. It must be acceptable. It must be readily acceptable by everyone and people must agree to use it. Divisible. It must be divisible. Our money should be able to be broken down into smaller units. Prob probability. It must be probable. It should be easy to carry around. Okay. So you guys understand the characteristics of money, right? Yes, ma'am. Susan? Yes, miss. So you understand what you just read? Not exactly. Okay. So durable. It has to be, you no, know, the money, the paper money won't waste The kind, the money that we're using nowadays, right? Let's just use that. The coin or the paper, it cannot wear out easily, meaning it, it has to go through a lot before that money can fade like you do some oily for washing in the clothes for it, the, the, it to fade. For the coins, it cannot be rubbed off. So that's what they mean by durability. Acceptable, it, it's accepted here in Jamaica. The US dollar is also accepted here. I'm not sure. Our money would not necessarily be accepted other parts in the world since the value is lower, right? Yes, miss. Yes, miss. So it has to be acceptable. I can take my $50 or $100 and go to the shop and it's accepted, right? It can be broken down into smaller pieces. It is portable because it's easy to carry around, regardless of how much. Unless you're carrying a, a bath full, which you know you're going to need some help with the silver, but it has to be able to carry around easily, easily accepted by merchants. Durable, it can be broken down into change. <laughs> It cannot be spoiled. Yeah. So those are the four characteristics. So unless guys? Yes, miss. Understanding? Yes, miss. Mr. Anderson? It's not Mr. Anderson. Okay. All right, so let's go. Susan, could you continue reading for me, please? The use of money meant that people could sell their surplus of goods in exchange for money and use the money to buy their needs. Money acted as a medium of exchange. 
trade became much simpler. Eventually, metals become a popular choice for money in any part of the world where it, it, where it was common. Metals was long-lasting, able to be divided into smaller units and sized scarce. Some metals, such as gold and silver, were scarcer than others, and money made from these was of great value. Okay. So they're saying that... Okay. They're saying that the use of money... You can use the money to buy basically anything. Its metal is accepted and it's very common and long lasting because it's durable. So all the characteristics falls into place here. It's durable because it's long lasting. It is acceptable because it could sell the service exactly yeah. it is portable because it can be used around the world it's accepted around the world and it is divisible because it can be used as exchange medium right so you see all the characteristics fall into place here so let's move on to functions of money what do you think would be some of the functions for money There are four functions of money. It's a medium of exchange, a unit of account and store of value, standard for postponed payments. Any idea of what you think medium of exchange would be? Okay, John, you can unmute your mic. Miss, I was saying trade, Miss. Okay. Because, and you know, sometimes while then, trading, sometimes while trading, for example, a phone, mm -hmm. you have to, to have money with it. So, Sandy, you agree or disagree? I agree. You agree? And yes, for yes. a unit of account now. Okay. Unit of account? would be how you intend to measure the value of that money, right? Okay, give me a second. And the store of value. Give me a second. It's running low. The other one is the store of value. Any idea of what you think the store of value would be? A store of value. <laughs> Yo. Well, 
this. Um, sorry about that. Yes. Sorry about that, Miss. Um. Miss <laughs> um. Yes, go ahead. Um, art. For example, instead of um, like you know, you would buy something at the shop, miss. You know, you mm -hmm. buy something at the shop, but it would expire, miss. You would use the money. Money, um, the money it can be stored to buy the goods whenever. Okay. So it can be reliable, saved, or store can be saved yes, up. Oh, okay. And the last one, just and I'm not hearing you. You want to explain what you think the standard for postponed payments are? No, miss. You don't want to give it a try? Um, Think about it. It's money that we're using on a daily basis, right? Yes, and yes. it's a, we're looking at the functions of the money. And it says a standard for postponed payments. So you earn it at one point and pay and and it can be spent at another. Right? Yes, miss. Yes, miss. So you earn the money now and you use the pay for something later on. Okay. Pijan, you want to read the medium of exchange for me? Mr. Anderson? Yes, miss. Yes, could you read the next slide for me, please? Medium of exchange? Yes. Money makes the exchange of goods easier and makes barter unnecessary. When money is used to in intermediate the exchange of goods and services, it is performing a function as a medium of exchange. So, Susan, you get it now? I think so. You think so? All right, let me hear what you think you get now. I think it's saying that oh. so we're using or Jamaican dollar and it says money makes the exchange of goods easier and makes barter unnecessary when money is what is barter miss oh okay i forgot you weren't here at the beginning of the class kejan would you mind explaining to tusan barter what? is the exchange of goods without the use of money just like your biscuits um, argument did come up that was bartering when one person have a biscuit and the next person have a biscuit but you don't like your biscuit and you prefer that biscuit yeah hear me clearly though yes yes sir. right so that's bartering basically no money no money currency no money is involved but what why we talk about as a medium of exchange 
is the fact that it is shifting of value from one th one person to the other. So you use money as that medium and that intermediary or so in between. And as me tell you before, um, Kijan, when you cut, when you get money, you don't really want money. You want something that money can buy. So it's that medium that allows you for exchange from one thing. You hold the money, then you move the money to where you want. That's a medium of exchanging one good for another. Basically, that's what the medium of exchange is. Yes, sir. Okay. Is this on here with us? Yes, yes. Miss okay. Morris, you have two minutes. Are you now move? Can you okay, see no how problem. fast you can go through these slides so that we we'll cover them within the next the time? Sure. So the other one is the unit of account. You can go ahead and do the reading for me, um, Kijan, for the rest of them. Unit of account. Money is measured in units that allows debt prices and the accounts to be calculated. To function as a unit of account, money must be divisible into smaller units without loss of value. Fun fungible, one unit or piece must be perceived as equivalent fungible. to the Fungible. Yes. Fungible. One unit or piece must yeah, be man. perceived as equivalent to any other and a specific weight or size to be verifiable, countable. Verifiably countable, sorry. All right, let me do cookie. All right. Um, hope my mic all out. My data kind of low, so it might affect the sound quality. But... Um, so first of all, money is a major is measured in units that allow debts, prices, and and things to be calculated. What that means basically is when you ascribe. First of all, let me ask you a question. If I give you one dollar, if me give you ten dollar, what where you can buy with ten dollar? Sweetie. Barely. Sweetie. Ask everybody, anybody. Can I ask sweetie? Barely. Talk. Not Barely. else, that's it, a sweetie. Yeah, if I give you a hundred dollars, where you can buy with it? A various amount of If I give you a hundred dollars, where you can buy with it? A I could. Um, give me one thing, where you can buy with a hundred dollars? I could. All right, good. Truth. So, yeah. let me show you something now. The first, anytime somebody give you money, the first person I say, I could, and after me. <laughs> say something else, it means to me. Ah, uh, they're not coming in clear. But um, what that means is when somebody gives you any money at all, the first thing you do in your mind is think what that money can buy. You associate your, that money with some form of goods. So as a measure of units, it allows you, if you can say, all right, if you tell somebody, say, you know what, go on, me, why have to do a piece of work? You use money to equate the value of the work that he's going to do. So if you decide to cut the yard, how do you know how much you pay? You will just say it costs ten dollars to cut the yard. So you use money to measure the amount of work that you do. So one ten dollar equal one cut of yard. That's what it really means. So you use money. You use money for ten dollar for one sweetie, one hundred dollar for one I could. Okay. You could so once if me get five thousand dollar, you already know it's five thousand dollar is way more than one I call. So instantly you equate the, the value of the money based off of what it is used to measure. So anything you get any money, first thing you do is measure where you can buy. So that's what it is. But in order for it functioning in that way, it must be able to go down into smaller units, like $10, $20, $30. All right? And if, if you break up money, each piece must look the same. That's why it means by fungible. So all $10 kinds look the same and it's the same amount of weight and everything about it. It must be equivalent to the other. All of them must have the same size and something and they must be able to quantify it and count it. That's it. And I was going through clearly. Was that clear? Okay. Was he clear, guys? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you're not understanding, if we just ask right. for... Not true. That's it. Moving on. 
Okay, so we have the store of value. Okay, John, you're reading? Yes, miss. Mm -hmm. Yes. Store of value. To act as a store of value, money must be reliably saved, stored, and retrieved. It must be predictably usable as a medium of exchange when it is retrieved. The value of money must remain stable over time. All right, so it, that is self-explanatory. Um, when you're putting on your money, you're supposed to you can't take it up back and it's still money and still have the same value. Now, in the video you hear earlier, they, they were talking economists never really want to call money money. They rather call it currency because there are certain things about it make it no, me, match or measure the rule. You know, some little things when them start to say, like one of them is that the value of money must retain, remain stable over time. But you know, say, 10 years ago, the same thing where you could have buy with $100, you can't buy with it today because the value of money changed. The value of fiat currency changed. So that is why them kind of have, which means it don't fit the criteria that they say it should meet to be saying that it is money. So that's why they want to say, well, we talk about bills as fiat currency as opposed to fiat money because it don't match up to some of these things. But yeah, in all though, in general, the value of money must remain stable over time. Okay. Good for you guys. All right, so we can go to the next slide. Susan, you want to read for us? Yes, miss. Okay. A standard for deferred payment. It is a standard of relative worth and deferred payment. And as it can be earned at one time and spent at another, Due to the fact that a value can be placed on money, it is possible to borrow funds now and repay later or buy goods on credit. So that's, that's two things in one day we're looking at. So as a standard for deferred, and deferred means to, to put off something for a later time. That's what deferred means. So, um, because we know of the worth of money, we are able to, to, to um, do some work. Like when you go to work, you know your work every day, and you know how much you work for. And at the end of the day, when you're done work, you'll get paid. So, you can earn. So, when you come to work today, you earn money, but you don't collect until the end of the week. But because there's value in it, you know what you're working for. So, you can collect. Now, your work is in that money. Because remember, you come out, you go to work and you, you, bring, you build some block and do all the power work and at the end of the week, you get paid. But you don't really spend that money yet. So it's all of your work store up in that money and when you're ready to buy what you want, buy with it. It was deferred until you decide to spend it. So you can't earn it just because there's a value placed on it. You can also borrow funds and, them, and, uh, and pay back later. Because there's value on the money, so you can't say let me get it back because there's a value place on the money. You borrow ten thousand dollars worth of coins from me, so later I will get back ten thousand dollars worth of coin. And I see same thing with buying and selling goods. All right. So basically, that's those are the current the those are the not characteristics. Those are the roles of money. The role that money plays. Yeah, those are the functions of money, of money basically. And that pretty much sums up the class for today and the unit, right? So, uh, the um, you were saying something, Mr. Brown? Uh, are you with us? You were saying something? Yeah, I'm call you, John. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I am Kijan, talking. your mic is mute. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. So, um, all of this will be everything that you went through, including a video recording of this lesson, will yes, be sir. 
uploaded on the student portal um, on the JotForm platform. You will also see some activities that you must complete by the next class. All right, so you just check, you will see the PowerPoint presentation that you can download. This is very PowerPoint. Yes, so you will also knowledge. see a PDF of it as well as the lecture notes. So you can take your time and go through it, okay? Yes, sir. Do you right. have any questions for your teacher? Well, you have questions for your teacher? That's good. Ask. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, how did you find this class? Well, I enjoyed this class, sir. It was informative. Okay. Good. And I learned a lot more about doing this. Okay. Um, Miss Brown. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, for what you when you you came in a bit late because you probably wasn't aware that the class started at this time. Um, from what you got when you came here, how do you find the class? It was very educational. I learned things that I didn't really pay much attention to while I was using money. Never really looked upon certain things. And I learned okay. about them and understand it okay, better tonight. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. So the next class right, will be on Thursday, right? So the activities need to be completed and turned in before class and be prepared to learn and move on to the next topic, right? You can do some read ahead read ahead and read over the notes from tonight and such. Have a good night. Miss. Thank you, Miss. Same to you. Uh, before you go, ma'am, just the before you go. Susan has a question. The work. You said we have an assignment to complete. What? I didn't really catch it. <laughs> I didn't hear what you just asked. Oh. The work. All right, like, so that she's... The, yeah. All right. So the activities that you're asking about is the class activities. It's going to be on the student portal. Um, you will have access to it um, later on to send and you'll see the activities that you're supposed to do. Okay. Okay. Um, is everybody, you hear me? Yes, okay, sir. Good. Um, Miss Morris, you said that your next class is on Thursday, but your next class is actually on Tuesday. Oh, Ms. Morris, your class is on Tuesday. My Thursday. apologies. <laughs> I am thinking that today is Tuesday. Hmm. Sorry. So next class will be on Tuesday. Yes, on Tuesday. Today is Thursday. Okay. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, y'all.